everybody and welcome. I'm your host, Katie Hazard, and I am Burning Man's Associate Director of Art Management, which means that I get to head up the art department, which is an amazing job. And one of the most fun parts of it is getting to host this program. So I'm excited to be here today and to welcome you to Art Speaks, the Desert Arts Preview Edition. If you are new to Art Speaks, um, I saw someone in the chat saying it's their first one, that's great. Um, this is Burning Man Project's artist storytelling series, which we launched last summer. And we've been having a great time so far with these, getting lots of good feedback, and we're just loving having this opportunity to showcase these exceptional Burning Man artists. So as folks are joining, um, please pop a hello into the chat. It's fun to share where you're zooming in from. Uh, it's cool to see, you know, this digital format allows us to come from all over the world. So um, like there's someone from Luxembourg, awesome, <laughs> New Orleans, all over the place, Salt Lake City, Germany, a couple spots in California. That's cool. Um, so a few tips about Zoom. I know we're all probably pretty familiar with it by now, but this webinar format, um, first, I want to encourage you to use the chat as much as you like the whole program. It's a really nice way to feel like you're participating and uh, it's a good way to share your thoughts or cheer on the artists. Um, if you have particular questions for the artists, you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A box. So if you would drop your questions in there, we can save them for the Q&A portion of our event. Uh, so today's program, what's the format? Uh, we have five different artists or art projects represented. Each one of them will share a video that's about five minutes long um, with a little bit of background and story about their project. And then we'll open it up to a Q&A with the artists, like I mentioned. So get your questions lined up, put them in that Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. And since we're doing this uh, special Desert Arts Preview Edition, we're also hosting a digital reception afterwards kind of like um, when we host this in person and we have a, a theater lobby to go to. So um, we'll, we'll send the link to that. So that's after the Q&A part. Um, so as I mentioned, of course, I think you all know today's episode is the special Desert Arts Preview Edition. It's our 10th episode of Art Speaks and the season finale of season one. We're going to go on pause during the extra busy event production season but don't worry, we'll be picking it back up in the fall with season two. So speaking of event production, to be honest, we don't know whether or not we'll be able to come together in Black Rock City this year. There's still so many unknowns at this point, um, but we're cautiously moving ahead with planning since you know it takes many months to, to make Black Rock City happen. You know, these artists are a good example. Like they can't wait to start building to the summer and hope to be done by August. So, uh, you know, we really do have to start planning earlier but we'll only be moving ahead if we can do it safely. So for more details, we just published a blog post a couple of weeks ago. We'll put the link to that in the chat or you can see it in, um, on the journal uh, for a little more details about where, where our thoughts are right now about this year's event. So honestly, calling this Desert Arts Preview might be a little aspirational, you know, it might, it might be a longer preview than, than it's been in other years, but, but I do feel hopeful about this year and even if we can't come together in person, you're likely to see these artists works at some point. And we will still be hosting a, a virtual burn week um, either way, sort of like last year's multiverse. So there's that piece to look forward to also. Of the five artists that we're featuring today have all been selected to receive honorary grant funding from Burning Man. So they're just five out of the 70 that we chose in early 2020. Um, when we didn't know what how the world was going to unfold. So we selected them in early 2020, these 70. And then when everything happened the way it did this past year, we've rolled that group of 70 over into um, this year or the next time we're able to come together. So of those 70 artists, um, we featured a lot of them in, in past Art Speaks or last year's Desert Arts 3 View. And all of those episodes are available to watch the recording of. So we'll put the link in the chat. It's also on Kindling if you want to go back and watch any of them and learn about more than just these five artists from today. And this is kind of funny, but on a personal note, I want to share that um, while many of these artists and you have been working on your art projects in this past year, I have also been working on my own creative endeavor. Um, I'm nine months pregnant, <laughs> which is exciting and also why I'm a little short of breath right now. Um, so yeah, my husband Chris and I are expecting a baby boy this month uh, really soon. 
Um, it's our first and it's, you know, a little bit scary, but also super exciting. So I will be out for a couple months, but um, everyone will be in great hands with the art department team. And next time we come together in Black Rock City, hopefully you can meet the newest baby burner, uh, baby hazard. <laughs> You know, I wasn't sure if I should share this here, but I know lots of you have been following along since the beginning of Art Speaks and, you know, with Zoom, there's just no way of knowing. So um, I've been growing this baby belly all these months and so I wanted to just share that that's what's going on here. So here's to each of us finding our, our own ways to be creative this year. <laughs> it's fun to see all the cliffhanger, season one cliffhanger, Katie Hazard is pregnant. <laughs> yeah, fun. Uh, so thanks for sharing my good news. And so without further ado, I want to get into introducing today's artist that we have. Um, first up, I'm really excited that we've got Abram Santa Cruz with us. Abram's work draws from his many years as a graphic designer, photographer, and painter. So he likes, by, by combining photography with painting and lighting, he creates works that are bold and bright and intense. He's part of an artist collective based in LA called Liquid Pixel, um, a group of artists, engineers, and friends dedicated to creating fun and large scale art installations. They've been bringing art to Burning Man for a number of years, and I'm excited about Abram's project for this next coming Burning Man. He is joining us today from New York, actually, where he's been commissioned to install one of his artworks. So welcome, Abram. Hi, guys. How are you doing? My name's Abram, and yeah, I'm super excited to be presenting KukuKan's portal. Um, we actually already built it. Uh, we built it before the pandemic started, before we even found out that we got an honoraria for it. So it's pretty exciting that finally after, I don't know, maybe 10 years of trying to uh, win an honoraria that I finally got the grant and I'm super excited to share the project with you. Yay, thanks so much. All right, let's go ahead and watch the video you've made for us. Hi, my name is Abram Santa Cruz, and I'm the lead artist for Kukulkan's Portal. And as you can see behind me, I have one of my electric dandelions, and right next to me, this is my son. What's your name? Alain Santa Cruz. That's right. This is my main inspiration over here. So anyways, I'll tell you a little bit about my art history and how I became to be an artist and how I became to build my first Burning Man project, and uh, I'll start that right now. So in 2005, I went to Burning Man and Peru back to back. I'd never been to either place before, but both places blew my mind and changed my soul. The experience was so intense that I came back home and quit my job in finance, and all I knew is I needed to be an artist. So I started doing these resin paintings, and in 2008, I was on my way to New York for work. And on the plane, I was reading an article about Julian Schnabel, who was living in Manhattan at the time. So I got this crazy idea in my head to see if he'd meet me and give me some advice. So I literally looked him up and rang his doorbell and asked like a dork through the intercom, Hi, uh, Julian Schnabel, uh, you don't know who I am, but I'm an artist and I'm a big fan of yours and I was wondering if you'd take a look at my portfolio and give me some advice. A, I can't believe he was home. B, I can't believe he said yes. And C, I can't believe he didn't destroy my work. He was very nice. And the biggest takeaway for me is that he said, go as big as you can. And that's how I got the idea for the Peace Wall, a giant version of one of my glass paintings. The issue was, is that I didn't know anything about addressable LEDs or programming. So I went on ePlaya looking for someone. And that's how I met my longtime collaborator and now really good friend, Dylan Cummings. So we built this with the help of my ex-partner and my Burning Man family from Camp Zazen and the Pink Spot, who have been the life support of all my projects throughout the years. And then, something started happening. We started getting invited to all sorts of music festivals to display our work. Then our next project in 2014 was a transporter. 
where we recycled 80% of the panels and the wood frame into hexagonal light panels that made a modular structure. The sea urchin was my concept for 2015. As my design started getting more elaborate, I needed to start partnering with people that had fabrication skills that I didn't have myself to bring these projects into reality. This was the year I started Liquid Pixel, a collaborative group of engineers, skilled workers, and friends. The Sea Urchin won a Global Arts Grant from Burning Man in 2016, which didn't get fulfilled until just recently in 2019 when it went on display at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. So one of the lessons that I learned from the Sea Urchin was to get the light tubes away from people's reach. So in 2016, the electric dandelions were born from two ideas. How do I get the light tubes off the ground and why hadn't I seen endless fireworks on the playa before? Little did I know they would take me around the world. Currently, you can see them on display at the Southside Seaport, right next to Wall Street and Pier 17. So finally, this brings me to my latest project. Kukul Khan's portal. We were very fortunate to have received a grant from the Toronto Light Festival to bring it to life before the pandemic hit in 2020. So right after Burning Man of 2019, I approached Topher about my next project idea. I came to him with this little drawing of uh, some from pyramids and some triangles, and he's like, hey, I want to build this thing. And this is a five-year dream in the making. And we started making a mock-up of it, and I realized this thing is giant, and I thought Abram was crazy. This, this is the Merkaba, so it's four pyramids and four pyramids that go together to make one single Merkaba. And I came to Topher, still not having a clear idea about how I was going, going to approach building this, this monster project. It's much bigger than anything I've ever built before. Um, much heavier, uh, technically a lot more advanced in terms of lighting, fabrication, and the margin of error of this project was so small that I needed to be sure that once we started building it, that it was going to fit together just right. We built this project lightning fast. We started the day after Thanksgiving. We only took two days off for Christmas. And then the day after New Year's Eve, we were putting it in a truck and shipping it to Toronto. I'm Charles, I'm the LED engineer for this project. It's been a lot of fun working on this project. We've got all sorts of fun things, such as 10,000 LEDs, almost 100 different patterns. We've got full 3D animations using um, some state-of-the-art controllers. There's all sorts of fun color palettes that we get to play with. It's been all sorts of different um, learning experiences. That concludes our presentation. Thanks for tuning in. And we do have a little surprise coming to you for the plier for this year. Wow, that was really fun, Abram. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of cool little details in that video. Like I love that story about you're just going up to that artist's place and buzzing his buzzer um, back in the day. Like it's cool when things come together like that. And you know, I was thinking, oh, maybe someday you'll be that to some other young artist. You know, your doorbell will ring and someone will be like, how do you make this lighting work? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been cool to learn more about your journey as an artist. I bet most burners know and love your dandelions, but it's fun to see everything that came before that. Um, and it's cool to see how many civic settings your work's getting installed in. That's great. I remember our both installing work at the Toronto Light Festival a couple of years ago. And uh, 
just watching people like mouths agape looking at the dandelions is fun to see. So that is one of the things I love about Black Rock City um, that people can just experiment and learn and you can go from not really knowing much about lighting at all to creating something like Kukulkin's portal that's just really phenomenal. So thanks Amram. Uh, so next up, I'm excited to welcome Ashley Strakey. Ashley is joining us live from Los Angeles and she's been going to Burning Man since 2011. Um, and here's something super interesting about her. Her day job is as director of neighborhood services for the city of Los Angeles. So she crafts policy there for Mayor Eric Garcetti. Um, and I just love hearing about the wide range of folks that make art in Black Rock City. Like people come really from all walks of life. So aside from that though, Ashley moonlights as an amateur graphic designer and a builder of pre-projection motion picture crafts like crankies and accordion viewfinders and camera obscuras. If you're wondering what those are, I think we're just about to find out in her video. So um, welcome, Ashley, happy to have you here today. Thank you, uh, I'm so excited to be here. And uh, uh, Abram, wow, that's amazing. So <laughs> I'm just uh, I'm really excited to be here with such an incredible artist, so thank you. Yeah, all right, let's go ahead and watch your video. Hi, I'm Ashley Strakey, and I'm the artist behind Peep Show, Land of Lost Encounters. Peep Show is gonna be a two-sided, vaudevillian-style theater in Deep Playa. If you are on one side, you're an actor, and you're gonna row down a river of an ancient rainforest where frogs are hopping, snakes are slithering, and monkeys are jumping around. However, you don't know it, but you're being watched. If you were to enter on the other side of the theater, you'd be an audience member treated to a wonderful show of somebody rowing down a river in an ancient rainforest. I've been coming out to Black Rock City for the last 10 years, and just like anybody else who goes out to Black Rock, I leave feeling really inspired. And Peep Show is uh, really a collision of all of that inspiration from Black Rock, in addition to all of these things that have been bubbling up in my life over the years. For many of the years that I've been going to Black Rock City, I've been really interested in bringing out a rainforest. That mainly comes from the fact that I absolutely love Ecuador. It's one of my favorite places, and I love traveling to the rainforest there. Uh, additionally, something that's uh, really inspired me is this book called Wonderland by Steve Johnson, where he talks about how play has really, um, really led to major innovations in, in our society, from everything from democracy to, uh, to computers and animation. I've always been interested in old technology, especially old technologies that were creating illusions uh, and are the precursors to movies and animation. So with Peep Show, my goal is to use these old technologies to create uh, an illusion for the actor to feel like they're going down a river in an ancient rainforest. Some of those technologies that we're going to be using are large-scale crankies, uh, which are essentially scenes that are going to go past the actor to create this illusion of going down a river, or automata, uh, which are simple machines that create kind of uh, different movements uh, that we're gonna apply to animals like frogs, monkeys, and slithering snakes. So one of the main aspects of Peep Show is that the actor doesn't actually know that they're being watched. And the way that we're gonna do that is by using uh, an old technology called a camera obscura which is really a pinhole camera that projects an image onto another wall in the other room so that the audience member can actually watch the actor without the actor knowing it. So I have a really incredible team that's going to help me build Peep Show. And they've actually been bringing things out to Black Rock City for the last 10 years, including a Viking death ship art car. Uh, so we feel very comfortable working uh, with the challenging playa environment. Additionally, my dad, he's been a mechanical engineer for over 40 years, and he is going to help us create the automata, uh, which will be the little mechanical animals that are gonna be really critical to Peep Show. For me, the excitement of building Peep Show is as much about the journey as it is about the final piece. And what I mean by that is the opportunity of experimenting with all these different types of old technologies to create the illusion uh, for whoever participates with Peep Show. Um, you know, we're still building out our team and looking for support. So if you're interested in learning more about Peep Show and what we're doing and how to support, 
please visit our website or check out our social media pages. Thanks for watching my video and I hope to see you on Playa this year. Oh, that was so fun. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I really like that juxtaposition of the, you know, the desert environment of the playa where everything's so dry and kind of white. And then the feeling that I imagine will happen when you step inside and suddenly you're in this rainforest. Like that's just that total change of scenery. Um, I think is gonna be a really magical feeling. Uh, I also love the old technologies. You know, I, I feel like we tend to glorify some of the new technology that comes to Burning Man and how experimental and cutting edge, and that's all very true. But um, I like having the older tech. I think it's just really kind of enchanting and not to mention it may work better with all the dust <laughs> that's out there. Um, and then the last piece that I found so touching was that you're working with your dad. Like people in the chat are all making nice comments about, um, uh, about that whole part of it. So that's really cool. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and now our next guest artist is Jason Grunlund, who is a professional blacksmith, sculptor, and printmaker specializing in works made of steel. He's worked on a wide range of projects in Black Rock City over the past 13 years, fabricating art, creating and driving mutant vehicles, building stages and theme camps, operating heavy machinery, you, know, you name it, the whole range. He's currently based in Guadalajara, Mexico, and he founded and continues to lead the international collaborative art project, Oklahara, which puts together artists from the US and Mexico. And it's not just Jason we have with us today. You'll see in the video that um, we've got a message from another dimension that the Magus Mascari clan will be joining us to also be talking about the faces that they're creating for this year's project, the Temple of Masks. So um, please join me in welcoming Jason. Hi, Katie. Thanks so much. What a pleasure to be here. And thanks for having us. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this video. I hope you have some fun watching it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, this video is um, going to be great. It's, it's super unique. So let's go ahead and roll that. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Gromlin, artist, blacksmith, and printmaker. I currently live and work in Guadalajara, Mexico but I was based in the Bay Area of California for many years before this. It was there that my interest in steel fabrication led me to become involved in a large-scale Burning Man art project back in 2006. Since then, I have been fortunate to work with some of the art all-stars before, during, and after Burning Man each year. Now, I am developing and bringing together my first honorary project, the Temple of Masks. Here, you can see some of the concept drawings of what the temple will look like when completed. In this past year, the structure itself has been put on the back burner and has given me the opportunity to concentrate on exploring and creating the masks. To give you a better insight of what this piece is about, I introduce to you our interdimensional creative director, Magus. Greetings from the multiverse. We have been called many things by life forms of differing scenarios. Here in this dimension, over multiple journeys throughout your short history, we have been called magicians, sorcerers, but the best translation for what we are is Magus of the Mascari clan. Not an individual, but a gathering of souls and energy from a very far away. Our origins are shrouded in mystery, even to ourselves. So we have stitched together many stories told to us in our travels as a way of understanding ourselves. In this moment, we find your world at a crossroads, another age of tumult and pestilence. And once again, a renaissance of the masses searching for identity. We have come again to record the ways of your kind and to transmit our findings via the Temple of Masks, a work dedicated to the delicate skin between the person, the spirit, and what transcends. This quest for beauty that unites architecture with sculptural filigree is a base from which to encourage interaction 
with a structure that in time will make ancestral questions about our origins. Humans are the art and craft in a pure state. From far away times, they were creating their outward appearances to their parallel realities that overlap until they melt into one. The mask is a magical element for our understanding, and they create a union between the tangible and metaphysical realities. In the flat and merely aesthetic, it is an amalgamated reality that is enhanced for the repetition of elements. In this case, the mask slides over the surface of the structure, making a gradual gain, degraded thanks to the sculptural form and the disposition of each being for their size, creating a hypnotic visual oneness. We all have a role to play in this universal stage that is our limitless realms put together. We make our way to every dimension possible, holding up a mirror so that you can see yourselves. We have found that no being has just one face they present. Wherever we wander, we make sense of where we are through the disguises used by the inhabitants. In your dimension, there is a rich history of masks that have been used over many thousands of years. But the hiding of one's true identity does not always come with bad intentions. In our case, we use these devices to make ourselves visible to you. Our physical being is nothing more than shifting ether. We have no eyes, yet we see plenty. We have no face, so we must construct them. When it is deemed safe to coalesce in person together, we will celebrate and transmit under the clear blue sky from a dry lake bed perfectly positioned and aligned for the transmission of universal love to the rest of the multiverse. For now, I bid you well and look forward to the elevating of our combined consciousnesses together. Arms raised in ecstatic expression, we are all one. Farewell, for now. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> you know, on the show, we, we talk about art so much, but I really love that Jason was like, I'm just going to make some art for my video. Like, I'm going to get right in there and do some performance art. And that was just really fun. Um, I think it'll give us a little preview of what the, the performative elements of the Temple of Mass will be like. And, um, you know, there's nothing like a, a visit from creatures from another dimension to keep things interesting. So thanks so much, Jason. That was a lot of fun. And now I am happy to welcome my friend, Michael Christian. If you've been to Black Rock City, no doubt you are familiar with Michael's amazing organic metal sculptures. They never fail to captivate me, both from afar and up close. Um, and after 22 years of his bringing art to Black Rock City, he's, I feel very in tune with the physical landscape. So his work can sometimes seem to just naturally and magically or organically just emerge from that playa environment. Uh, you know, he's kind of one of the rock stars of Burning Man art. And I have to admit when I first got to work with him, maybe like seven years ago or so when I started working here, um, I had already been going to Burning Man for, oh, probably a dozen years by then. So I knew his work. And so when I started to work with him, I was still had this little bit of like, oh my God, Michael Christian, you know, um, but now, now I'm lucky enough to call him a friend and I still really deeply admire his work. So I'm happy he's here with us today and welcome, Michael. You're on. I think you're muted. <laughs> I told you I'd mess it up. Yeah. Hi, Katie. Great to be here. Hi, Michael. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Right. Fun to be here. Cool. Let's go ahead and watch your video. Sounds great. Hi, my name is Michael Christian, and I'm coming to you live through the magic of voiceover. <laughs> uh, so I want to take you on a quick stroll through my art. The work I was doing in the 90s was largely focused on creating broader sensory experience. I uh, found myself creating installations that incorporated sounds and smells and touch and a different level of experience that was more physically engaging. 
I worked with fiberglass, steel, and found objects from wherever I lived at the time, being the city or the country. In 97, I was approached by Burning Man with the idea of creating a sculpture from the bones they had found on the property during the setup of the event. It was exciting um, because it was an opportunity that I've been looking for, for something beyond the more contained art and boxed buildings, move slow, don't touch experience. Really enjoyed the no-plan, free-form process of building as well, so I kind of just jumped in. I had no clue that this would be the first of 22 honorarium projects to follow. Uh, we had two days to build this particular incarnation, so as is, as is often the case with installations like this, you don't exactly finish as much as you just stop working. Uh, the following year, we created the Nebulous Entity, a piece that rolled about the playa spewing fractal sounds and processed conversations and sounds of Burning Man collected live and then entered into a library mixed with volumes of pop culture. It was just randomly pushed about the playa by participants. I had a pilot inside operating an interactive sound lighting system, but he actually had no idea where he was most of the time. Uh, after this, I built a creature from one of my sketchbooks called Flock, um, a piece was originally two inches tall in my sketchbook, but it ended up being 42 feet when done. <laughs> Found its way to City Hall for a spell as well. I really enjoyed building the armature of Flock, uh, bending the tube steel into organic shapes, so I continued this process and building several pieces that followed. I just would bend tube and hold it to the air and figure out where it went. Pieces grew in size and weight over time, so I began to incorporate the idea of easy assembly into the design. This eventually led me to be able to uh, have these large monumental sculptures that could easily travel about the country and overseas and be installed in a day. Uh, we modified this particular piece for Vaudevere Society to tour it as part of their performance. I eventually built bigger and heavier pieces like this 40-foot tall tripodial <laughs> alien with rotating head you could climb into. Um, actually worked on the idea of it rolling about, but deadlines are a cold breath of reality that you need sometimes. So we passed. Um, this piece traveled quite a bit and eventually ended up in Toronto where it lives permanently. I really enjoy animating the hard steel into more organic forms. It's fun making these friendly but maybe not so friendly creature type sculptures from time to time. Fulfilled my sculpture quota for tall pieces with this one called Elevation. It's a single throne on top of a 60 foot tall structure for the American Dream theme that year. More fun with metal and pieces that take advantage of the vast landscape of the playa. I like incorporating different day and nighttime experiences with pieces as well. I really got into the rotating spherical shape for a while for a period and uh, Made a couple of sculptures involving this. Home was made uh, with these multiple layers of metal cutouts in the shapes of street maps. I just installed a stainless steel version of this in New York City last year. EPOD was a big ball of fun. It could easily hold 50 to 75 people, and it's spinning about. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I had wanted to bring it out to Burning Man in 2020, but we know how that went. This is a fun piece called Brainchild. It's installed on the property that I live. Uh, this is a piece titled Keynote. It was made of locks, and he, she, it was dragging this giant key behind, behind them. Uh, many levels at work for me personally on this one. Uh, which leads me to this year's project, currently called Heave. Hard to name pieces before building them, but this feels good at the moment. Um, the latter has been floating in my art life for 30 years, it seems, uh, sort of sums up my artist journey moving, climbing along experience. Um, the latter piece showed earlier was titled Climax, but with a K, its origin comes from climbing or the process of climbing instead of its current association with culmination. It's more about the experience, the journey, uh, building new rungs. It can be a slippery slope at times as it's a never-ending process that fold in on itself and collapse sometimes. Um, so you have to pause and build more runs and move on more again. And there you go, moving on. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. 22 projects, when you said that, I was like, wow, that's 
you might hold some kind of record. <laughs> um, but it's really fun to see the evolution of all your pieces together. You know, like I, I could probably name like 10 of them, but to see them all, I'm like, oh yeah, that one. Oh, and I loved that one. And oh, I remember coming across that one. So thanks for um, for sharing your, your kind of whole catalog of Burning Man work with us. That was fun. And finally, uh, last but certainly not least, today we have with us Renzo Verbeck. Renzo is the architect and co-designer of the temple. So it's an honor to have him here with us today. Just some quick background on him. He is an architect, sculptor, and contractor practicing for 30 plus years based in Colorado, just outside Boulder. And in 2019 for the Temple of Direction, he was the crew leader on Playa for all aspects of the temple build. Um, uh, just a note about the temple, you probably know we selected this temple design and team in the end of 2019. It was meant to be built in 2020. Um, so it's been quite a while of time working together. And I'm grateful to have had the chance to get to know Renzo a little bit better over this time and see him in action with his creativity and dedication and leadership um, as he's been shepherding the temple project along all this time. So. I'm excited to have him here with us today so we can learn more about the Empyrean Temple, including a sneak peek at some special footage of some portions of the temple that the crew has already built. So please join me in welcoming Renzo. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate that. It's wonderfully glowing comment is very generous. I thank you very much. Um, we do have a video and um, please roll it. I'm ex glad that you have the opportunity or I have the opportunity to show it to you. Great, thank you. Let's go ahead and watch. We are in the beginning. Nothing is here. We are in the land before time, before humankind, before footsteps, before consciousness. The Black Rock Desert is, at the same time, the oldest thing and the newest thing. And for us, it begs the question, what is needed now? What I see most in the desert, what really impresses, is the power of the gentle, slow-moving forces on what might appear to be unmovable entities, the rocks and the mountains. What results are sculptural forms that inspire the mind. It's really, it's breathtaking. In the black rock desert, like perennial flowers that follow the rain, that follow the searing heat, a city of ephemeral improbability is born. It's born against all odds and reasons, only to burn in the searing heat and vanish inspiration of nature and community so improbably coupled inspire works of creation building here is both new and old and a genuine responsibility what is unique about the desert any desert but the black rock in particular is the blank canvas feel of it it represents unlimited potential the playa meets the mountains which meet the horizon and melts into the sky this is timelessness we can hardly comprehend the moon cycles with the seasons which provide a reference point where we can start to grasp and then the sun cycle tells us that there is perennial hope of creation here's where we can begin i always start with what's there with the community with the family the nature and the sky design within context don't force anything the black rock desert is a blank canvas that allows us to build something completely unique, derived from its awesome natural palette and 80,000 voices that want to transcend, if only for a moment. What I know is that this inspiration is limitless. I find metaphors are a great leaping off point for architecture. They are a guiding path. For my art, I don't employ that method, I don't know why, but for architecture, it works for me. Really in the design process, I developed a terrestrial metaphor, which included path, sheltering sky and destination. Many architectural elements in Empyrean came from this. There are a lot of metaphors running through over and around Empyrean, which both hold it together and simultaneously allow it to explode with energy. Earth, sky, and fire is another such metaphor. With Empyrean, there is no floor. We touch the earth. We need the light to feel the warmth. The flame burns eternal. The star connects heavens and earth. We know what we want out there. We want a gathering space, a safe and unpretentious space, a void space, untouched by legacy. We need the temple to contextualize the environment, nature, and society. 
a landing space, a launching pad. The canopies are everything. They shelter, provide respite from the sun and wind. They are the home of the wandering tribes and they are arranged by and for the heavens. They inspire awe with their cathedral naves and cast celestial messages by shadow. The canopies face each other, generating energy, pushing to the center void. They hold space. The canopies hold the ring, focusing the immense generated energies. Masculine and feminine balance here, suspended in the air and time, delivering a moment of balance and truth. In the flame which lives in each of us, the flame resides in the middle of the canopies. The beacon of eternal hope, the point of passion and purpose, the galactic transceiver, the beacon of the city, the beacon to the city. It says we're here, we're safe, you are welcome, welcome home. We have the opportunity to invent here, to create a new language, a new language of inspiration if only for a fleeting moment. Art and architecture start with emotion. They become emotion in fixed form. Light animates this emotion, and therefore all art and all architecture is a play of light. Metaphors are the guides, the shamans that walk us through the creative process. There's a reason for every element of the period. A journey that cannot always be told, it can always be felt. Put together in one transcends. We're in a very different place now, New dimension, the ethereal land of the metaphysical, the home of Empyrean, the center without a center, the nexus without a name, the space between where everything and nothing becomes the same. We have a rare opportunity here, one that perhaps most souls never even contemplate. A moment to dance in the moonlight in an empty plane to build a new language, to create and hold a space for reasons that not only we don't know, but also that we just don't need to know. Empyrean is a calling. Her flame burns brightly, illuminating the desert sky. A familiar welcome beacon for the wandering tribes. Her voice will not be quieted until all experience the transcendence they seek and find comfort in her arms. Oh, that was beautiful, Renzo. I, I feel like you managed in a five minute video to kind of give us all the vibe of what it's like to be in the temple. Like I just feel sort of more like hushed and reflective and, and calm and it, like that was just beautiful. So thank you. And it's really a treat to get to see those first two out of the eight pieces that are going to form the temple this year. What a beautiful installation so far. So thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm. So we've now reached the part where we're going to come into a, a Q&A with all of the artists. So I'd like to invite all five of you to come back on the screen, turn your cameras back on, and, um, and we'll go ahead and have some questions for you. So I see there's a couple people already have asked a few, so we'll start with those. But you see that Q&A box, feel free to um, add your questions into that box. Um, Abram, I have, I'm going to start with a question for you. Um, with being curious about the inspiration behind your honorary piece, Kuk Culkin's Portal, um, what does Kuk Culkin mean? And I think I remember seeing that there are Mayan symbols involved in it. Um, how, how does that relate to it? Right. So Kuk Culkin is the Mayan feathered serpent god. Um, he's pretty much the main god uh, of the Mayan culture. And um, my grandfather, he's 100% um, native Mexican of that Mayan descent. Um, and so I've always wanted to explore that part of my heritage and don't really, didn't really know too much about my father, uh, grandfather's history. And one day um, before he passed away uh, a couple years ago, he, um, I sat down with them and went into, you know, detail with them about his, about what it was like for him as a child. Um, uh, little did I know he was disowned from his tribe for marrying a Western woman. Um, uh, yeah, and so, uh, you know, things that I just had no idea of, of, about him and uh, I just wanted to explore that part of my uh, culture and history and mm -hmm. wanted to incorporate that into this piece. 
That's neat. So we met your son, Ryan, at the very beginning of the video. Do you think at some point you're going to try to kind of convey some of that heritage to him? Um, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to uh, take him through Mexico and get him down to the south of Mexico and explore parts with him. And um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to try to get him to, and also try to get him to build art projects with me someday. That would be really great. Uh -huh. I, I really appreciate how Ashley incorporated uh, um, that part with her father and stuff. That, that, that was pretty inspiring. Mm -hmm. I loved that too. Well, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ashley, somebody is actually asking some more questions about your dad, um, whether he's been to Burning Man before, if he's coming this year, if he's ever made his own art projects. Uh, no, he hasn't been to Burning Man yet. Um, he makes a lot of different, he's uh, an incredible uh, mechanic. Um, he works a lot on Corvettes and things. I don't know that he's made art projects, but uh, it'll be a fun uh, father-daughter teaming. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he has, uh, for my wedding, he actually helped me make a, a cranky uh, program. So he was like cutting the wood and helping me figure out all the mechanics of it and stuff. So it's, it's been very fun. That's cool. Um, yeah, and while I have you, I'm curious um, about how your role as the um, Director of Neighborhood Services in LA, how does that impact your art making? Like, how do you think those two, I mean, you could have any kind of job in the day and that would make your art be different. Like, I'm curious how that particular work influences your art. Yeah, I, um, well, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I guess what I would say is uh, I have often looked at my job as like my identity. Um, and, you know, Burning Man gives me an opportunity to kind of explore something different about myself. Um, and then kind of see how I can bring it back to my job, you know? So, you know, we're creating a temporary city out in the desert every year. And it's the same thing here. We're creating a, a city in, in the default world here uh, constantly and kind of thinking about how to uh, create greater participation and immediacy and, and things like that. So it kind of goes back and forth. And um, I'm just really excited this year to, well, hopefully this year, um, to really uh, explore this side of me that I don't often get to, to kind of put on the stage. Mm -hmm. Cool, I like that. Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking first about how your work will influence your art, but I like thinking too, how you brought it back around to how your you know experience in the Burning Man culture, like how, what kind of influence you can have there. Like, I love stories like that of, you know, ways that people come to Burning Man and learn the culture and then they start to kind of, you know, infiltrate in there. In their <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, definitely. That's cool. Thank you. Um, Jason, a question for you. Um, somebody would like to know if you imagine a persona for each mask or, you know, does each mask have a particular inspiration from myth or stories? Um, yeah, I think a lot of, I'm very interested in history. Um, I think what got me specifically interested in masks was um, kind of Greek theater in particular, and a lot of the imagery that they're playing with. Also a lot of uh, kind of like different theater from around the world um, where, you know, these things, these masks are basically a way of portraying certain things to people. Depending on what that is, they can be very powerful or sort of um, kind of a way to just to relate with people. And also, yeah, I don't know, each one, yes, each one is very different. I think I'm exploring different themes with each mask. And I've kind of had this idea list where I come up with ideas, I write them down, and I kind of get to the masks later um, as I'm going, because the metal work itself is, is time consuming. But the idea is they just keep on coming. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's time consuming. They're really intricate. They're so beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Someone else was asking if you have a sense for how many you might create. I mean, it's hard to know timing wise. Yeah. I mean, I think the goal would be somewhere between 150 and 200. Wow. I've got about 20 right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's a lofty goal. It's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to need some help if anybody out there wants to <laughs> come to Mexico. Yeah. Well, we have your link in the chat here. So if people want to reach out, um, yeah, please do. <laughs> Look, people are already volunteering. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> You're like, come on. <laughs> um, 
You know, actually, and speaking of Mexico, I'm curious how your living there has influenced this project. Like if you were still living in Oakland, do you think the masks would have a different kind of flavor than, than they're coming out, you're living where you live now? Um, hmm. Yeah, I think, that, I think that living here has changed a lot of things for me, both like kind of socially, uh, culturally, of course, I'm a, I'll always be a foreigner here. But, um, you know, I think that the imagery involved in a lot of imagery that comes from Mexico is enchanting to me. And I just, uh, you know, I, I think one of the skulls was on there, of course, there's a lot of that kind of imagery. Um, you know, there's a different, there's a different concept of death here that I think I really appreciate and I think that makes people a little bit more comfortable with it perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Michael, someone is asking here, um, what was your most challenging year on the playa? Uh, something different every year. Um, IT probably, the big, with the rotating head piece, the large sculpture, um, I actually found a limit. Um, back in the day, we used to work during the week and we'd finish Wednesday of the event. Um, that was, I think we finished that Thursday evening, but I think Wednesday night, everything broke down and I just said, I'm done. I thought that I've reached the point of like, I don't care. And I didn't think I'd reach that point, but I did. And I, they said, just take a walk. So I walked off um, and then came back and they managed to get the generator running and then the welder started working and then we started picking up and we finished Thursday night and then I put the ladder in Friday. But uh, it's fun to reach those points where I thought nothing will ever, I'll always be like, no, nope. I just reached the point where I don't care. It was good. I mean, it was it was a bad, it, not a great experience, but it was probably one of the best experiences I had in the desert. Mm -hmm. I know you can't help but wonder sometimes if like, if you hadn't have gotten to that point and just like given up, would things have stayed frustrating for a lot longer? Was it like the moment of your throwing your hands up and being like, I can't know that like then somehow things started to come together? Like it's- It's more when you have this illusion of invincibility and then you're humbled mm -hmm. that experience where you think I, I can do anything and then you're like no can't yeah so yeah, those are good for us good to find your limits for sure <laughs> yeah and there's nothing really like burning man to help you see where they are <laughs> yeah I mean there, there's so many other elements I'm exhausted I haven't slept in two days and the crew is falling apart and they're fighting and you know there's a whole maelstrom of things yeah. occurring that lead you're to hot, something's broken you can't find the whatever you're hungry yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean and the equipment we don't have the right equipment and it's just me and this thing weighs you know eight thousand pounds and you're trying you can't do it without other people at that so so many lessons learned each year there's something new uh every year a new lesson learned for sure i mean that's why i keep doing it it's a fun exploration to push yourself and um, as was mentioned earlier it's to me as well it's really about the process by the time i'm done i kind of just walk away because it's no longer I'm no longer a part of it. It's something else that's gone out into the world and for other people to enjoy. But for me, the nugget is really in the build and in the process of experiencing that creative process. Does it look a lot different from you now? Like say you're working on Heave, does your creative process, you know, 20 years in, like it well, must have yeah. evolved dramatically. Yeah. You think I have some wisdom, but even with that, um, I fall on my face. And it's great, you know, it's a great experience to, to come out on the short end. Uh, Cause you're like, oh, I know better. Now I'll build on that and do, do something in another direction. I mean, I, that's, I, there's a diverse number of pieces cause I like moving to the next thing. It's usually in the process of building something that you're already generating the idea for what's happening. It could be something very simple, like how you made something you're like, oh, I want to explore this more, but I have to finish where I'm going. And that birds another idea. And so you keep exploring uh, new projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. It's true. Once you're in the groove of a thing, it tends to be, it leads you to the next thing. So I don't have a lot of 
the you know that's funny one of the peace flock i installed in texas like six years later and i was laying down underneath it with friends and i actually had an experience of like wow this thing is cool um but it was literally six years later because i i was not in a place to be able to appreciate the work that i had done and it was only once i was very separated from it that i could come back and uh, appreciate what it was and it was cool i did not have that experience at the time mm -hmm. like glad to be done see you later right um, like you guys go have your time yeah, yeah right exactly we actually took it we were coming back from uh we had taken it to coachella back in the day and it was on the truck and I came out and I was so ready. I had my sawzall out and I was ready and I started to cut some of the pieces up because I was ready to take it to the the rescrapping. I was just done with it. And my friend was like, no, don't do that now. And it was great. I mean, I, I didn't. And I went on to install it several times, but I definitely at that point was like cutting you up. You're done. Enough of you. <laughs> Yeah. That's actually one of my favorite ones in Black Rock City. Like I like seeing it installed in other places, City Hall and other spots, but somehow the way that you know, you know, folks watching flock someone with kind of the long feet that come up and then there are these maybe three or so that are like this, that I just remember in a dust storm, like seeing it, you know, and your work just emerges from the environment in such a beautiful way there that it was kind of like, it, they looked like they were just growing out of the ground there. Like you, they were some- uh, You're talking about the three pieces? Yeah. No, the flock is the real tall kind of amorphous leg thing. Those were drips, but yeah. That, oh, I thought that was flock. Uh, no, no, but I mean, sure. <laughs> it looked like a flock to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the same same idea. And I think as after a while, I started to know what it felt like out there. And so you could build with that in mind. But in the beginning, um, I mean, actually participatory art, I really wanted that to happen, but I was not aware of the level of participation that people unleashed would experience. Um, and it's intense. Um, we would do, we'd drive around now and look at pieces and kind of bet on how many days it will last because people are building this in their garage or someplace and it's like amazing energy and they bring it and people are just gonna destroy it. So I kind of, after having a couple of pieces destroyed, started to incorporate that into the build, like, okay, where it's gonna get destroyed here. And so you start to incorporate elements of climbing, just anticipating what they're going to do and how how severely and enthousi enthusiastic they're going to be. And not with intention, but just will jump on it, swing on it and just break things. So I wanted interactivity and I, I got it, yeah. People do love climbing on your stuff. <laughs> funny because I'm afraid of heights. I don't like heights. And so uh, I made it up into that elevation piece once and I was white knuckled all the way going up to the top, but everybody else in the crew did it. So I had to, but not a fan, not a fan of heights. Oh, funny. All right, well, I'm keeping an eye on time and I realize I have a handful of other questions lined up. So. Um, Renzo, I have um, two questions people are asking you. The first is, how can folks get involved in helping to build the temple? Um, go to imperiumtemple.com and there's a sign up opportunity there. And that's pretty easy. That's super straightforward, thank you. Um, and then someone else is asking about the experience of having the virtual Imperium last year. Um, what kind of takeaways or learnings there might have been from having an online temple space? Um, did it work? Um, yeah, if you could talk about that for a moment. It, it never ceases to uh, impress upon me the seriousness of temple and um, how, how much it means to some people. And, and it's important to, um, to build for everybody. And to some people, it's, it's, uh, it's a coming together place it's a place for friends. It's a place to get out of the sun. It means something architecturally. There's inspiration for architecture and it means a lot to the build community and it means a lot to the guardians and it means a lot for photographs. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people who really, really need it. And that can't be lost on the process. That has to be 
even though maybe you know perhaps only five percent of the people really really quote unquote need that most of the energy has to go to that and the rest can be filtered out otherwise and so the process last year um just showed that and reinforced it again um that there was a great number of people that were very dedicated uh, to building that ethereal empyrean and to making it work and to participating with it and to find real experience with it and um, what does it mean it means it's a big responsibility it's it's beyond an art piece definitely <laughs> certainly thank you yeah <laughs> Um, Abram, another question for you. Someone is curious to know what challenges did you have making your pieces weatherproof? Are cold and rain much different from the dust? Yeah, that's uh, that was pretty interesting. The first time that I went to um, Toronto with the electric dandelions, I had a uh, big rude awakening to that. Um, there's a level of moisture there right next to the lake uh, that I hadn't experienced before with other projects. Even when I had the dandelions in Reno for two years, there was more corrosion from three months in Toronto than there were in two years in Reno. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, I, I mean, you learn some tricks of the trade. Uh, you use, uh, we end up we ended up using dielectric grease in all of our electrical connections, trying to keep moisture out of the LEDs of the electronic components. Um, I moved to only working with metal and polycarbonate now um, to resist, uh, you know, it's very weatherproof, both of those things. Um, I'm, I stay away from uh, as much as possible from wood. Uh, in, and so, yeah, um, there was, there was some growing pains in trying to make art for a place like Toronto versus art for the playa. They each have their different, um, you know, set of challenges, especially like Michael said, people are the, the abuse, uh, I hate to call it abuse, but in the end, uh, when you have a lot of people climbing something that isn't supposed to be climbable um, or not intended to be used in that way, then um, yeah, you know, you have, you have to plan for that. And so building for Burning Man is also a little bit different than building for other locations where people aren't as um, as prone to climbing art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to have like, I love this show house. There's so many different people on here and people have everything from like philosophical questions to technical questions. So it's, um, it's cool to get that kind of more practical side from you. And you know, you were telling us you're in New York right now installing something. Are you having to make accommodations there too, I would imagine? Um, yeah, I'm actually in New York right now. I have 10 of our electric dandelions uh, here at the seaport right uh, next to Wall Street. And um, uh, I'm actually just uploading some new animations. The client asked to have some like Easter spring animations so that, um, you know, give people, get people out of that cold weather uh, feel and trying to get people to feel more lively and uh, excited about spring coming along. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I guess yeah. I hadn't thought about the way you can program the lighting wherever it is to kind of fit the, you know, maybe if it's Toronto in the winter, it kind of can have that wintry vibe or yeah, a range of. Yeah, actually no one's ever asked to have custom lighting uh, for specific holidays with the art. Um, and I've always anticipated it, but no one's ever asked for it. People just kind of always just appreciated the animations of the dandelions for what they were. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is, this is new, this is fun. I'm, I'm enjoying the process of creating something custom that the client's asking for. So. Yeah. How long will they be installed there? Uh, right now, they're going to be out up till the end of April, um, but uh, they have an option to buy them. And so we're waiting here whether or not they're going to do that. Crossing yeah. fingers. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I hope for you Thanks. that too. Yeah. Um, and Ashley, I want to circle back to you for another question here. Um, Someone's asking what first brought you to the rainforest of Ecuador and what keeps bringing you back? Um, well, actually my husband's uh, 
a nanny and you know family member grew up and had a house in Ecuador and we went and visited them a few years ago and uh, had just the most incredible time. Actually, I also remember when I was like in first grade, uh, this is really random, but uh, we did this, um, we did this thing at a camp where, you know, we were trying to avoid food waste. And as part of that whole process, they would like donate to like saving rainforest. Uh, and so I think I always just like had this like excitement and interest in rainforest. Um, so anyways, when we went to Ecuador that first time, uh, we went to this place outside of Tena um, and actually like slept in the forest and ate bugs and, you know, went on adventures and hiking and everything. And it was just like the most amazing, uh, the most amazing thing. And so we've been back twice uh, so far and went to the Galapagos uh, the last time and just, just love Ecuador a lot. It's so nice to have some other special place in the world that's like your place that's, you know, like we are also immersed in the place where we live and it's, we just get used to that being like, this is what life is like, but um, it's nice to have another spot that's kind of like your other place that you're like, oh wait, life can really be different and it can be like this. And yeah, I definitely. I, it's, uh, it, I'm actually, I've already like kind of, it's like, aside from going and visiting my family after the pandemic, I'm probably going to go to Ecuador. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the band Bernie man, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I think we all have our lists of like where the first places we want to go are going to be once we can. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Hopefully it's not too much longer. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, Jason, I have a question for you um, that someone is asking. Masks have taken on a very different meaning after COVID. Is the meaning of your artwork different today than it was a year ago? Yeah, um, obviously this honorarium was written and approved before all this happened. So it was kind of a surprise to me um, that it would be kind of so relevant. Uh, personally, I found that I really like the masks. I like being able to go outside and nobody know who I am. Um, <laughs> as part of blending in, I kind of, I found that I've really liked that. Um, as far as meaning, about the project for other things. Yeah, honestly, I've considered, and, and I will be making some masks more like this, just these kind of face coverings. Um, and obviously it's it's kind of a, I've, I find it interesting how controversial they've become, you know, these face coverings, because people really want to have their rights or um, I don't know what it is exactly, but the, uh, but actually having the concept of the mask, yeah, it's taken on a completely different form. And I think that I'm excited about what that means for the event and when this project comes to life. I think it'll be a little bit more relevant to people, which is great. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I guess burners are a little more used to wearing masks than the general population, just because we're, you know, we've got our dust masks and we all have our collection. And I remember when COVID started, I went to the garage and got out my Burning Man mask and was like, okay, I can, I could do this. But um, yeah, I mean, yours just take it to another whole level. And now we're so accustomed to wearing one that, you know, you can't not have one outside and not feel strange without it on that. Uh, I think the way that people will interact with your project will be certainly different now than it would have been before this. Yeah, and I, and I don't ever, I don't think everybody has the same kind of, I can be somewhat shy, imagine that. And uh, <laughs> a mask really helps to uh, put, out, put out a different feeling, really. Mm -hmm. Well, especially yours, you know, because it's this whole persona and it's, yeah, it's not like <laughs> just the ones we wear outside, like people can still tell who we are. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Thank you. Oh, I'm conscious of time and I, I um, see we're past an hour, but I have one more question um, for you, Renzo. Um, while the temple represents many things to the Burning Man community, chief amongst them may be honoring loss and remembrance. Given what has transpired in the world over the past year and surely over the next six months, are there any particular changes or additions that have been contemplated or incorporated in Empyrean since its original conception? <clears throat> One of the uh, programs that we tried to do um, last year, all the way up until um, the first of this year, was to bring as many maker groups into the process as possible by building these uh, four by eight panels that create the lattice work that's up on the sides of the canopies. And um, interesting thinking about Michael and his just hitting a wall, and we just hit a wall on that. We tried so hard, so many different ways, and because of COVID and because who knows, maybe the message was wrong. We, 
we just couldn't make it work. So we ended up building all the panels on site, which was a wonderful experience because so many people got to um, build them on site. And I love teaching people how to make things. And I learned a lot about the process. And we made 200 of those panels on site. Um, as a consequence, um, we're not gonna try and shop out those panels to other people in the future going forward if for Burning Man this year, because we need another 400. Um, we're gonna bring it in house more. And there is an opportunity to, for some people to make, um, to participate by simply sending us a small piece of wood, which we were literally built into the temple. And um, we're working on that process and uh, we're not there yet, but it is a project we're working on. So there will be an opportunity for people. I mean, literally just a, a piece of wood this big, uh, maybe a one by four by 18 inches long, but you can send it to us with your message on it and you can cut the angles appropriate for the panel, and we will literally build it right into the process. Oh, I love that. So that's it. Yeah, I mean, I like this person's question that asked it, because it really is, you know, every year we have a temple at Burning Man, right, or since 2000 anyway, like that's part of our culture to have that sort of spiritual home space, but it's true that this year it's like, you know, I think I saw in the New York Times, it's like one in three Americans has lost somebody this year. And it's just, um, I'm really grateful to you and to your whole team for making a space that we can all really have a chance to kind of be with that, you know, like it's, there's a lot to process and where do we go with that? So that's, I'm glad that, you know, there'll either be a virtual one or a real one this year that we can have a place to, to just be with that. So thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. You are, thank you for the opportunity, all of you. I mean, you know, all of you have, um, all of you have more experience in Burning Man than I do, every one of you. So you guys built this, all of you folks, and you handed it off, and I'm very grateful for that. Hmm. Oh, okay, well, ending at a gratitude moment. Um, we are a little definitely past time here, um, but I'm just really enjoying our conversation with all of you, so thank you so much. Um, but it's really been a treat to spend this time together, and um, Stay tuned, actually, in a, in a few minutes after this ends, we're going to go into our, our post-event reception thing, so you'll have a chance to keep connecting with the artists and each other. So um, in closing, though, I really just want to say thank you. Um, thank you to today's artists. I know it's been a weird process having your grant and build be extended all this time. Uh, I give you lots of credit for your patience and persistence. So thank you for keeping your creative vision alive and for sharing your stories with us today. And I'm excited for the day when we can see your work come to life in Black Rock City. Uh, I also want to thank the Art Speaks production team at Burning Man, who are such pros and make this a great experience for all of us. We've really had a wonderful time together co-creating season one, and we're looking forward to season two. And then to you, to all of today's participants, a big, huge, sincere thank you for attending today for supporting the artists and for whatever ways you are finding to stay creative and connected this year. If you have any feedback, you can reach us at artspeaks at burningman.org. And we do have a really short survey. Um, it's, we'll drop it in the chat right now. It'll also be in the thank you email. Uh, it'll really help us craft the best experience we can going forward. Um, in terms of future programming, if you join late, you may have missed that this is the season finale of, of um, season one of Art Speaks, and we are excited to kick off season two in the fall. And um, an invitation to participate. So now that you've heard these stories from today's artists, remember that Burning Man is all about participation. There are no spectators. So remember that you too can be involved. Um, if you're feeling optimistic about this year's Burning Man, the registration for art projects opens on March 17th, um, coming up in just a couple of weeks via burner profiles. Um, and everyone's welcome to bring art to Burning Man. Or maybe you're inspired to work with your local community and share your creativity closer to home, which is also a great option. So there's lots of possibilities. And lastly, the work our team does year round to support these artists is part of the larger mission of Burning Man Project, which is a nonprofit. So if you feel moved to support us, we would truly appreciate it. Um, please consider making a donation today. No gift is too small and we really thank you for your generosity. 
help us continue this work, keeping the art of Burning Man alive and help us hopefully bring back the magic of Black Rock City in all of its glory. And you can do that at donate.burningman.org. So now I wanna invite you all to come join the lobby experience. In the 20 plus years we've been doing Desert Arts Preview, it's been an in-person event um, hosted at a venue like a theater or a museum. And when the program ends, part of the fun is going and mixing and mingling with the artists and other participants in the lobby. So we have a fun digital take on that experience and you're all invited. So let's all head over to that lobby site to keep the fun going. The link will be in the chat here. Um, today's artists will be here as well as some other honorary artists and um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you there. So thanks again for joining. Um, I'm going to miss Art Speaks over these next months, but I'm sure I'll have my hands full here and uh, I can't wait to see you all in the fall or actually I'll see you all in a few minutes in the lobby. So goodbye everybody. Thanks so much.